Today's episode is brought to you by the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Now listen, the current political and social climates, combined with the urgent challenges that our black men and boys are facing, demand that we act boldly right now. 25% of black children don't graduate high school on time. Compare that to the national average of 17%. Now if we compound the issue even further, black male graduation rate sits at 59%. Compare that to 65% for Latino males and 80% for white males, and you realize why CBME is a beacon of hope. They're the only organization right now making themselves available to those leaders and organizations that are underground, working to advance the cause and reverse this narrative for black men and boys. If you've not yet done so, I urge you today to visit tbpod.com slash partners. Learn more about the campaign for black male achievement. Consider joining their membership and investing in the future of our black men and boys. You're listening to the trailblazers.fm podcast, where we'll explore the stories of today's successful black professionals, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Join us to access the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished professionals and come away with the know-how, confidence, and motivation you'll need to blaze your trail. And now here's your host, Stephen A. Hart. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Trailblazers.fm podcast. I'm your host, Stephen A. Hart. Today is the third episode of our 2019 Trailblazer Entrepreneur series. And if you missed the first two episodes of the series, you know you have to go back and check out those episodes, right? Our featured Trailblazer for today is Jerisha White, known to her tribe and the world as Sherry J. You can find her over on Instagram at Sherry J. Lovely, but Sherry J is a young, smart, a really an accomplished businesswoman who started her first business back at the age of 23 years old. And she now owns several daycare facilities in the Atlanta metro area. She's an author of the book Success Souvenirs, which is a memoir that details some of her life's most defining moments. And she also has a platform that she operates under that Success Souvenirs umbrella where she has led several, I believe more than a dozen entrepreneurs now through the formula that's led to her own success. She's also a motivational speaker for women and teenage girls and just doing so much amazing good things, right? And I have to tell you, I am so happy when we find and feature these types of episodes, right? It's awesome when I land and I'm able to feature the John Rogers and the Janice Bryant Holroyds and the Eric Thomases of the world who have tremendous wisdom to share and tons of followers that you know we leverage to reach more people. But the mission work I do for trailblazers.fm, right, is more about the Sherry Jays. It's these hidden gems who are truly accomplished trailblazers, but also incredibly transparent. They've already blazed a trail, but their work is still in many ways ongoing. And so you're getting a ton of relatable, practical wisdom that I think we can all learn from and act on and apply in our own work and our lives right away. So, you know, I'm always, I just wanted to take a quick minute here. I'm always fighting myself to make these welcome intros short and sweet. But I have to tell you, there are a lot of people who I have been hearing from recently dealing with health issues. And I felt called today to take an extra minute, if you will, before we dive into our conversation with Sherry J. And I want to ask those of you who are prayer warriors to join me in praying for one of our own. Gloria Mitchell was a featured trailblazer on the show earlier in spring of this year, back on, I believe it was episode 170, 170. And over the past few weeks, she's shared with me in direct communication and also with her own community across social that she's dealing with a recent discovery of a brain tumor that is going to need to be removed very soon. And so, you know, the tumor is resting on a nerve that could impact her vision and her hearing. And she's really emotional at this point in time, as many of you would imagine, or probably be yourselves, right? And so honestly, my heart's been breaking this week thinking about this. It's been on my mind quite a bit. And so I am just being authentic in reaching out to you, our community, and saying, you know, if you are a prayer warrior, if you believe and have, you know, belief in healing, in God's power to heal, I'm asking that you would stand with me in prayer and I'm thanking you in advance for doing so. And if you're connected to Gloria on Twitter or LinkedIn, do reach out and just share a positive word with her and a digital hug, right? I know she would appreciate that. And so 
thank you for allowing me this extra minute just to share that, share my heart with you for Gloria. That said, I won't delay us any further. I want you to go ahead and grab your pad and pen or open your note-taking app and let's get set to receive today's Mission Fuel from our featured trailblazer, Sherry J. White. Sherry, welcome Hello. to Hello. Trailblazers.fm, girl. Thank you so much for Thank being here. Thank you with for us. having me. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's kick things off from a place of gratitude, where we often do. What are you feeling most grateful for in your life right now? Most grateful in my life right now is I'm grateful for my sanity. Being able to process and deal with all of the stuff that I deal with on a daily basis, it has a tendency to drive you borderline insane. So I'm just glad that God has granted me the gift of sanity to be able to deal with everything that I deal with in the manner that I deal with it, you know, in and still be okay and come out on top. A lot of us take our sanity for granted. You know, everybody does not have sanity. There are some people whose minds are totally gone and they have genuinely, literally lost them. So I'm just glad that mine is still intact and is able to allow me to perform all the duties that I perform on a daily basis. I know that's right. (laughs) I agree with you wholeheartedly there. (laughs) So you're in Atlanta. Is that where you're from? No. Originally, I was born in Indiana, raised in Seattle. And then from Seattle, we moved to Georgia. So I've been here forever. But originally, no, I'm not from Atlanta. Mm. About to date myself, Sherry, I remember back in 96, not some of mm-hmm. 96, I was about to go into my junior year of college and I drove, at the time I was in college in Tampa, and I drove up, spent the summer in Atlanta, hustling around the city, trying to make a buck off the Olympic Games that were, were oh, okay, in, okay. that year. Typical Jamaican style, I had two jobs, I think I was working that night in Buckhead Valley in cars and then working in the Olympic Stadium during the day. But that's mm-hmm. that's one of my fond memories of time being in Atlanta. Well, Olympics, that probably was in the sixth grade. So. <laughs> like I said, I know I was going to date myself. I'm 42. <laughs> So <laughs> where was your family from? Were they from Indiana? Do you have roots there? Or yeah, what, what took you around the country? Yeah, Indiana is where my entire family is from. My dad was also an entrepreneur and he ended up moving to Seattle. He was in the uh, music industry and had a few record stores. So he ended up moving his business to Seattle and opening up a franchise of record stores there. And so, of course, you know, my mom went with them, and then that's how we ended up in Seattle. And then once they split, my grandmother lived in Georgia already, and we left Seattle and, you know, moved here with my grandmother. And so that's how we ended up here. Wow. That's fantastic. So you did have an entrepreneurial gene. Or did you kind of know from an early age, like, you'd probably pursue something in that realm? In the No, I always thought well? I was going to be an astronaut. Really? <laughs> so, yes. I don't know why, because even now to this day, flying gives me anxiety for some reason. But (laughs) I always thought I was going to go to the moon or something like that. So I guess when you look at that from a different perspective, Mm. technically, maybe I did go to the moon and shoot for the stars or something like that. But no, you know, I never really knew what I was going to do, especially from having my daughter so early. You know, it's just kind of something that I guess was meant to happen and was supposed to happen because... I really didn't have a clue, you know, what my life was going to end up like or what I was going to do. So I witnessed it, but I didn't necessarily (laughs) know or feel like that was in the cards for me. Yeah, I have one right now that might want to go to. I have a nine-year-old who's obsessed with space right now. Like everything is (laughs) space clothes and had to paint her whole Mm -hmm. room and, you know, space stuff, space theme. And yeah, she's very obsessed right now with it. (laughs) <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty cool. So today you're the owner of a number of childcare facilities, right? And let okay. me do this. Take a minute and just tell us okay. about your business ventures and what's driving you right now in the work that you find yourself doing today. Okay. Well, I've been for the last 13 years, owner, CEO of uh, several childcare centers. I started off with one, ended up with two, 
went to three, then sold one, then bought another one. So I've been kind of playing this game of charades for the last, it started maybe like in year three of my entrepreneurial journey. So for the last 13 years, childcare has been my main and primary source of income and it's been my passion. Mm. So yeah, I've been doing that forever and a day. I do have a few things that I do on the side. I have a motivational speaking company. I have a company where I offer classes to people that want to open up child care centers or people that are interested in the child care um, industry. And then I also do classes for business in general, people that just need to know business sense because they don't have any or don't know the first step to being a successful business person, not even necessarily a business owner, but just a business person. What is driving me right now is I'm kind of, I wouldn't necessarily call it rebranding mm-hmm. my child care centers, but what I'm doing is something that most people don't. I'm trying to take a small mom and pop branded company or corporation and twist it to give it more of a corporate level feel. So a lot of my centers are in low income areas. All of my centers are in low income areas. So most people look at those type of areas and those type of centers as a you get what you pay for type of deal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, mine are totally different because I have so many. I'm not depending on one center to allow me to live whatever lifestyle I'm living or pay my bills or keep me afloat. I can. My strategy is to have several different centers going at once so that collectively they all can offer me a personal life in turn. If I'm only taking a little bit from each pot, it leaves more money in the center to allow for things that are unheard of Mm -hmm. in these communities. So I hope I'm not losing that. No, not at all. It sounds like you're effectively leveraging the collective, right? Of all the centers, which is great. Absolutely. So what's motivating me right now is that it's working. What I love listening to you, I mean, you're still relatively speaking, you're still a young woman. From what I'm reading, you know, you started the first center in your early 20s, right? Yes, 23. So this is amazing to me. So let's dial back for a second because you start dropping gems on us already. But I know I have a tendency to do that. (laughs) I'm so sorry. No, not at all. Don't apologize for that. We love that here. But describe your thought process and kind of what you're feeling when you decided to venture into entrepreneurship at such a young age. Because like you said, you had a child at an early age. What kind of brought you to saying, hey, you know, I'm going to start a business, yet yet alone like a childcare facility, which is, in my eye, one of the hardest kind of businesses to run, right? Because you're taking care of kids. You might have a passion for kids, but you don't realize your customer parents that are obsessed about their kids, right? Exactly. So bring me back to the thought process. Yeah. Talk to us about the start. So what it was for me was the fact that I had my daughter at 14. Her father's side of the family, that was the business that they were in. Nobody gave me any handouts. In order to earn money to take care of my child, I had to work. And my mother had a full-time job. You know, she worked for the state of Georgia. So, of course, she couldn't provide me any income. I couldn't do a traditional job. I was only 14. I wasn't old enough to technically be working. So in order to earn my keep, I had to work in their child care centers. And at that point, they were still at the in-home level. But nonetheless, I still had to learn and do everything in order to make, I was making $150 a week. And wow, that's what kind of started the child care portion of things. But then once I graduated high school, I was like, oh, I want to get far away from child care as possible. Like, oh my God, kids. No, I've been having a child since I was 14. I've been around all these years since I was 14. No, 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 no. I'm gone. So Sherry, Mm -hmm. let me not let you like dilute this. You're 14 Mm -hmm. years old. You have Mm -hmm. a daughter. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you still went to school and you were working to earn $150 a week. Unfortunately, that was. Wow, girl. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Keep going. Sorry. You got my mind blowing over here. (laughs) It's okay. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah, so, okay. So, so I want to get far away from it. So after I graduate, I worked for a few major corporations, Wachovia Bank as a mm. teller for a couple of years, Iron Mountain, which is a technology escrow company. I was lead administrator there for a couple of years. I've always been extremely smart and had great administrative skills. So it wasn't a problem finding and keeping a job, but 
to me, it felt like it was just that a job. And what was going on was even though I was making okay money at, you know, 20, 21, making 14, $15 an hour, that's great. But overall, I did not see that providing a life for me and my daughter, you know, in essence. And I was sitting back watching everybody that I had worked for in my earlier years, as far as childcare was concerned, they were growing and they were taking their in-home daycares to the next level and opening up small buildings and opening up, you know, actual learning facilities and they were flourishing and doing great. And it was just kind of like, wow, you know, when I worked for these people, I pretty much did everything. They taught me everything because again, I'm very smart. And I was like, I don't think this is, I don't think I want to do this. I don't want to sit behind a desk and, you know, work for anybody. So I ended up getting a good job at Atlanta public schools. I was executive assistant to principal at one of the newest um, school campuses in Atlanta. And while I was there, I just started like planning. And I was like, okay, I'm going to be here this amount of time. I'm going to save this amount of money out of every check every year when I get my tax return instead of, you know, going to Walmart, buying a comforter set, buying some shower curtains and redecorating your home. You know, that's what everybody does when they get their tax check. I'm going to save it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the entire time that I worked there, I just was saving, you know, I wasn't doing a lot of the stuff that I used to do because I had a goal in mind. And finally, when I got to a certain number, I reached out to Janiah's grandmother and I was like, you know, look, this is what I've been doing. This is how much I have. What can I do with this? Where can I go with this? And from there, really from within like 90 days from The time that I reached out to her and she was willing to, you know, lend her hand, I was open. I had my center. I was, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you never had to borrow money to get started? No, she gave me, I want to say $3,000. I was about $3,000, maybe $3,500 short of my goal. But no, no business loans, no, nothing that I had to pay anybody back. It was literally just, I just saved save, 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 save. And Mm -hmm. I was short. And again, you know, that's family. So she was like, you know, I want you to do good. I want to see you do great. And Mm -hmm. furthermore, you have my grandchild. So, you know, you're going to need just a tad bit more. So, and gave it to me with no questions asked. You know, I don't want to miss anybody listening, right? Like there is so Mm -hmm. much value in us looking at and helping the next generation up behind us. Right. right? But there's so much that woman granted you, right? And gave to you in that process, right? And I hope that doesn't get missed on. A lot of us, you know, looking at wanting our kids, sometimes we want to force our kids to go into these different professions or, you know, not help them with their passion and their vision. And, you know, God bless this woman who saw it fit to kind of bless you in that way, right? How do you not Because like, you know, as I have these conversations on this podcast, Sherry, you know, I talk to so many black women entrepreneurs and there's, there's a whole other dynamic, a whole other challenge to being one young, you know, you're in your early 20s, you're black, mm-hmm. you're a woman, mm-hmm. and now you're trying to be an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. What <laughs> was the difficulty in navigating that intersection, right? Oh, it was horrible. Nobody took me serious. Mm. Everybody that was working for me was older than me. And everybody who was bringing their kids to my daycare was older than me. So, I mean, that, <laughs> that's kind of the odds are stacked against me in both those areas because everybody that I need to take me serious isn't taking me serious more so because I'm so young, I'm attractive. And it's just kind of like I'm African-American. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, yeah, where's the owner? Mm-hmm. <laughs> where's the owner you get what I'm saying like where is she and that's what I went through for so long because I would have to constantly have sabbaticals and you know back and forth with my staff with everybody because everybody took me as a joke you know they did not trust that I knew what I was doing and sadly I can say this now that I'm a vet in the game to be honest from that aspect of owning my own business I really didn't know what I was doing I knew how to make it look like I knew what I was doing but they were valid right so it was learning for me but it was also trying to I won't necessarily call it a finesse but trying to you know pat them on the back and pacify them into trusting 
Mm-hmm. So that was extremely challenging. How many people were you able to start a business with? Well, when I first opened, I started with one lady and myself. So I would get up, open up the daycare, and then she would come in. I would go back to work because I was still working a full-time job. Mm-hmm. So I would go back to work at the school system. And then when I got off of work at the school system, I would come back and then she would get off and I would work the rest of the day. Mm-hmm. So I started off with one. And then as the business grew, of course, everything else grew with it. Yeah. More kids, more staff, and it just went uphill from there. How long was it before the business was truly profitable and you felt like? Uh, well, that building, that business, I would not say that it was profitable in the sense that I could do anything I wanted to do, but it was profitable enough to where I was able to leave my job and not miss a beat. So right. that at that point in time, that was considered a profit to me because my main goal was to be able to put 100% into my business. But what I will say is that time did not come until I had the guts to walk away from my job, but I didn't do that initially. So, so you're running like, it part time and working, working. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So it wasn't growing. You know, it was, it was, there were kids there, but it wasn't growing. It didn't have my touch. You know, the lady that was there, she was there for a paycheck. So she wasn't going to recruit and retain clients and you know, make sure that it smells good when you walk in. Just a little stuff that mm-hmm. could be all the difference in getting a client, keeping a client, you know, great word of mouth, those types of things. She wasn't going to do all that. She was going to do what she was paid to do, which was come in, be there when I couldn't be there and then leave when it was time to go. And so it really didn't start to grow until I was able to say, OK, you know what? I'm going to have to do this myself. The hard part is not over. It's really just begun. Let me ask you something. Was there a clear limit, like in terms of risk, right? Was mm-hmm. there a limit on what you're willing to risk? Like, did you have a mental number? Like, you know what? If it gets to this point and I might have to fold everything, right? And move on to something else. Mm-hmm. Was there ever that kind of challenge or, or you know time what? in this? Initially, no. Because at 23, I didn't live anywhere near the lifestyle that I live now. So at mm-hmm. 23, it was kind of like, okay, car note is this amount rent is this amount, all those sales, I could just go back and live with my mother if I absolutely have to. So I really didn't have much to lose. I had Mm. something to lose, but nothing that wasn't worth me trying. But what I will say is fast forward a couple of years in, maybe three or four years in, when of course, you know, you start getting all this money and then you just spending it because you got it. Mm -hmm. There were a few times where business was not going as good as it had been going or as I planned. And it was to a point where I had so many bills and so many responsibilities, but the numbers weren't coming in that I'm like, okay, if I get to this point, I am going to have to go back and get a job or do something and just let it go. Because if not, I'll be on my behind. So initially, no, because, and that's a whole nother story. You know, we as entrepreneurs, we as people that used to a certain thing. So when we finally get it, we don't understand the value of it until we risk losing it. Mm. So initially, no, I was just like, you know, it was enough to do everything I needed because I didn't have anything or any expectations. But, you know, in the future, yes, I was like, okay, I may have to get a job. And several times I was just like, you know what, I this is going to have to be something part time. I can get somebody in here to work it and I can probably take home, you know, a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred dollars a month profit and that'll just be supplemental income. Yeah, plenty of time. Plenty of mm-hmm. time. Plenty of time. And in all of this, I mean, you're probably giving all your time between working, you know, in the season of still working and growing the business. I'm sure a majority of your time was spent in the business. How are you managing being a young mom in this season? Was your family kind of helping with your daughter? Like, you know, I, no. I just imagine no. a difficult period, right? Oh, yeah, very much so. Like my daughter, and that's why, and my daughter is 20 now, and she is a great entrepreneur. She has her own spa. But nonetheless, I use it as a teaching tool. Mm. So it's kind of like when I was up at 6 o'clock opening the daycare, she was up with me. And before I was going to work, I was taking her to school. And then when I was getting off work, I was picking her up from school. And she was going back to the daycare with me. So she witnessed everything that I was doing firsthand. So a lot of the time that we spent was 
building and growing my business. And then we were home early enough for me to cook. I was helping out with homework at the daycare and go to bed and wake up and do it all over again the next day. So on the weekends, sometimes we got to, you know, do certain things. But from early age, you know, she's been working. So Mm -hmm. it was very, very, very hard. And not to mention she was going to school kind of out of district. So it wasn't like I could just put her on the school bus. And, you know, I couldn't do that. I had to literally, she went to school almost 45 minutes one way from where we live. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So when people are like, why am I so strong, even like dating and stuff? I'm like, look, people don't know what in the heck (laughs) I had to go through and endure from such an early age to be able to be the way that I am. So when I say I'm thankful for my sanity, you kind of understand a little bit more (laughs) why now, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So talk to us, talk to our young entrepreneurs or even our aspiring, right? So we have a number of people listening who might still be in a nine to five listening to you saying, you know what, Sherry pumping me up and giving me motivation to Mm -hmm. see this idea in my head through. What are some critical steps you'd recommend as someone's looking to begin building their business? The number one critical step is no matter how good it's going or looking in the very beginning, don't walk away from it. Don't look at it like, oh, okay, well, I've got it to where I want it now. You know, I can walk away and do other things. No, 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 no. That point isn't going to come for a very long time. And it's going to look like it's there a lot of times. But the minute you get it to a great point and then you start to ease back and walk away, it's guaranteed to plummet again in some area. Mm-hmm. So you have to stay consistent. No matter how good it's looking, it's never good enough for you to put it in somebody else's hands or assume that everything is fine. That's critical step number one. Critical step number two is every dime that's coming in that business, save it. Don't spend it. You know, put up a salary for yourself, of course, because you have to live. But anything extra, put it up because, again, you're learning the flow of your business. So you could have a great year and then have a horrible two years. But what you did in that great year is going to set the tone for those horrible two years. They won't be so horrible if you made a hundred thousand profit and out of that a hundred thousand profit, you only spent 20, you kept 80. And the next two years you're in the hole 40. Guess what? You're not in the hole. You at least broke even because you saved. Do you understand what I'm saying? So never think you got, don't just assume because you had a good year in 2018, 2019 is going to be a blast. It very well could be. But in the beginning stages of your business, while you're still learning and finagling the processes, you could implement a new rule, a new strategy, a new policy, a new procedure into your business that may not be what you needed, but you don't know until you try it. And it could have an adverse reaction. So while you're still learning your business, don't assume money's going to come or business is going to be great because sometimes it's not. Put that money up because if you don't, that could be the number one reason that you have to go back and work for somebody else. And it almost happened to me. Mm. Wow. Those are great. I love that, Sherry. So let me ask you, so let's shift gears. At what point did you have the idea to open more daycare, more childcare facilities? You want to know the truth? Of course you want to know the truth. Of course I want to know the truth. (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, the first daycare that I opened, the one at 23, the area that I picked was never meant to be a permanent area. Mm. Based on the amount of money that I had, it was what I could afford. It was far out. It was in an area that was not what I consider to be a flourishing area. So it was a very challenging area. Um, And a lot of people, you know, I could have waited and said, okay, well, I'll wait till the location that I really want comes along, but I couldn't afford what I wanted. So to answer your question, I always knew I probably was not going to be there long because again, I just had to get my foot in the door. Mm -hmm. So after the first year, again, I was making enough to, you know, pay myself at least what the school said system was paying me, but that wasn't good enough. And I knew that there was better out there. So within the first year and a half, I'm exaggerating maybe when I say a year. So within the first year and a half, I had already started brainstorming on ways that I could make a move. Mm. So what I ended up doing was 
in the first year and a half, I kept that building, but then I found something. It was a lot smaller. My first center was licensed for 35 children. I actually downgraded. This one was only licensed for 18 children. And what I did was I kept the one that was licensed for 35 children and I tested the water for the one that was licensed for a lower number, but it was in the area that I wanted to make sure that was really the area that I wanted. Because keep in mind, I wasn't in no position to lose anything, but you don't know until you try. Mm -hmm. So that's when I opened my second one. So not because I was like, oh, I'm doing good. I'm doing great. It's time to expand. Honestly, I had to open that second one, even though I really could not afford it because I was no longer confident that that first one was going to be able to take me to the level that I wanted to go to. So the second one was always kind of like a primary backup plan, like I guess I like to call it, because it was what I wanted to be my primary daycare, but it was, you know, kind of like a backup plan too, just in case the primary daycare I already had didn't work out. So from there, once I got to that place with the 18 kids, I was making, and this is just a matter of location. This is, you know, how, how a location can make or break you too. But that, that center that was licensed for 18 kids, I was making more no than I was making. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's when I say, I, so I sold it. So somebody else found me or I put out an ad or however I did, I don't remember, 13 years ago. And somebody else was trying to break into the industry. And again, it was a great starter daycare. It was even a great daycare for somebody who felt that area was great for them. Mm. And from there, so again, like I said, I started off. He with sold one, the then first location. Two. Sold the first location. Absolutely. Wow. Sold it. And then I used that money <laughs> to, to buy another one. To buy another one that was bigger, <laughs> but in the same area. So I, yeah, nice. I played all kind of games, you know, just trying to find my way, just trying to figure it out, you know? Yeah. In all of this, is there anybody that, like, were you able to have accountability or mentorship? Did you have somebody who you floated ideas off of, was able to kind of help you think through some of these decisions? No, to be honest, no. Um, my Janiah's grandmother, and that's the thing that I love the most about the way that she helped me. She's one of those, she's a prominent businesswoman as well. She's extremely successful, several daycares, but she's one of those people you know how you just say you may have a professor and it's kind of like, okay, you get one pass all semester. And once you use that pass, <laughs> you're on your own. Her grandmother is that type of businesswoman. I'll help you one time. Whatever you do with that help is going to be on you. Mm -hmm. So after she extended her hand that first go round, that was it. And she's the only person that I know or knew that I would even listen to any advice that they had to say because I knew what level I wanted to be on and nobody else that I pretty much knew that was in our industry. I didn't feel like any of their advice could get me where I wanted to go. Not to say that it couldn't, but I just didn't feel like it could. So the blueprint that she gave me, I literally just took it and added my sauce to it and I never deviated from it. So I don't ever feel like I needed to have a mentor or somebody to bounce these ideas off of because the person that was as successful as I wanted to be had already pretty much molded my mind where it needed to be. It was just up to me to get creative with it. Mm -hmm. Wow. So would you recommend to other people, you know, to be able to expand? Like, is there any potholes, any advice or wisdom you want to share about like navigating that process as you scale? Yes. I would recommend a mentor. Number one, don't be like me. See, <laughs> what I want to make sure that I put out there, guys, is my thought process came from struggle, mm -hmm. meaning asking people for help and people telling you no. And then you get what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I never cared to have a mentor outside of the person that I knew would help me because I feared rejection. You know, having a child at such an early age and needing help. And having people to constantly tell you no or treat you like your life is already messed up, it's kind of like a point that you have to prove. Like, that's the point that I had to prove. However, I do feel like I could have gotten through things a lot smoother if I would have put my pride to the side and asked for help. Even if people weren't where I wanted to go, that does not mean that they did not have valuable advice 
to give me on my journey along the way. But I just had a goal in mind and I just didn't feel like I needed to downgrade from what I had already been given. But being and knowing what I know now, no information is ever a downgrade. If you get information from Oprah, right, that doesn't mean the information you get from me is invaluable. Mm -hmm. I'm nowhere near Oprah's level. And Oprah's information, or I'm sure, is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't negate the information that I have to give you. It's two different sets of information and you use each piece of information based on the level that you're currently at. So the pothole to me would be, even if a person, I tell you something, somebody always told me, you can learn a lot from a fool or you can learn a lot from a person you deem to be a fool. So just because a person isn't where you are or where you want to be, doesn't mean that you can't learn anything from them because you actually can learn how not to be in their position. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I love it. So I love your gems, by the way. Listen, there's so much wisdom you're you're packing into. I can't believe we've been talking for just over 30 minutes and you've already (laughs) shared so much wisdom. But, you know, you started another brand, Success Souvenirs, right? Talk to me about Success Souvenirs. Well, Success Souvenirs is exactly what you said earlier in our interview. It's a reach back. You know, somebody lend their hand to me in order for me to be where I am. And I'm proud to say that. And Success Souvenirs is basically a channel that I have for entrepreneurs to just kind of get a motivational pep or I drop videos. I do all kinds of things that can help people along the way. I don't really have the time to actually mentor or mold anybody because, again, like I said earlier, I'm in another building process. Mm -hmm. But whatever I can give people that is free or that doesn't take up too much of my time or where I can answer quick questions. And, you know, I do a weekly blog every week that's absolutely free. I do a newsletter every week that's absolutely free. The only thing you have to do is sign up. And in these communication channels, they display pretty much everything that I'm going through, how I'm working through it, and a way that if a person that's reading is going through the same way, you know, a way that they can get through it and navigate through it as well. So Success Souvenirs is my way of giving back. I love it. So how does someone access Success Souvenirs? Um, Is it it a tribe? Is it a community? Well, I call it the Success Squad. So yes, (laughs) it is a a tribe. You can also go to the website, successsouvenirs.com, or you can visit the Instagram page, which is at Success Souvenirs. And yeah, from there, you are able to see what we have to offer and just kind of navigate your way through the site, go to the blog, go to the, I call it the Sincerely Sherry J letter, and it goes out every week. Go to that letter and you can go back as far as you want to and just read some of my tips and everything that I have to say. And again, all of these things are free. It's not a charge. It's not a membership amount or anything like that. It's just kind of my way of giving back. Sherry, I love your transparency and your authenticity. And I could listen to you all day long talking, (laughs) talking business. Genuinely, honestly loved this conversation. And I really thought we were going to go like an hour and a half. Cause, but, but you packed in <laughs> so many gems inside of this time we've been talking, which is great. Yeah. Right? As we get set to wrap up, a couple questions for our Blazing Nation community. They love the resources of our guests. Is there okay. any books that you'd recommend us adding to our reading queue? Well, my book, of course, which is self-titled Success Souvenirs. And basically... It's just a book that I published that just kind of, again, everything that we talked about in this conversation, but it also gives ways and motivational avenues for a person to, you know, just kind of gain that motivation that they need. What Another book that I like, and not because I'm like psychologically crazy or anything like that, but uh, most people probably have already read it, but the 48 Laws of Power, a lot of the laws don't apply to a lot of people, but some of them do, you know, just knowing like how to control yourself, how to be self-motivated. And a lot of people don't realize the underlying tone of that book to me is learning who you are and how to use whatever gifts you have to work for you. So it might sound a little cliche, but there is a lot of information in that book that honestly could, you know, help people along the way. Now, are we talking action books? Are we just talking motivation? (laughs) Either or. I like urban, you know, novels. So a book that I'm reading recently is called Certified Thriller. It's an urban book. It's a great book. I liked it because 
the narrative is based out of Indianapolis, Indiana, which of course mm-hmm. is where I'm from. Roots. And then yeah. it comes to like Houston, Atlanta. It's, oh, it's so good. It's very action packed. And there's a part two to it as well. So it's called Certified Thriller and that's Amazon and stuff too. Other than that, you know, I read a lot of business stuff, like, you know, stuff from Forbes and, you mm. know, Warren Buff and Bill Gates. I'm that type of person. I'm always, mm. even if I don't understand all of it, mm. I always like to read it because I feel like somewhere down the line, it's going to spark coming. something in my mind and say, oh, I read mm. something about this. So mm. I'm all over the place. But those are avenues that I can say for sure that I have read and they have you know, made some type of marker impact in my life or that I just enjoy. Love it. Sherry, before I ask you the last question, tell our listeners where we can stay connected to you. You can stay connected to me again via Instagram at Success Souvenir. You also can follow my personal avenue, which is at Sherry J. Lovely. SuccessSouvenirs.com is another um, website and those are really, I don't do Facebook. I do have a success souvenirs on Facebook, but I'm not very active on there. So Instagram or my website would be the best way to stay in contact with me. Sounds good. Last question before we, we wrap up. What's one action mm-hmm. that our Blaze Nation community should take this week that's going to help them to blaze their trail? Okay. If you're a existing entrepreneur, I would like for you to re-interview your entire staff and not to get rid of them or to replace them, but re-interview them to see if they are still where they were when you initially hired them. You know, people change and your company and you as a business owner, you're not the only person changing and growing. The people that are working for you changing and maybe they're growing, maybe they're not, but that's something that you always need to know and stay ahead of because it's going to allow you to visualize or get an early grip on a person that may not be beneficial to you or your company or a person that may just be going in a different direction than you need them to be. So if you go ahead and re-interview them, you may be able to find out that information early on as opposed to later on down the line when this person is just totally unhappy or the fan or whatever the case is. So that's what I would give to my current entrepreneurs. Re-interview your staff this week if you can. And to my aspiring entrepreneurs or even just business professionals, my action that I would give you guys for this week is find one person that is where you want to be and just take notes on them this week. And every week from this week, just take notes. If they have an Instagram page, if they have a company, they have a blog, if they have a website, Each week starting today, go and take one note about this person or their company that you like. And then by the time you're ready to start your business, I want you to go back to that list of notes and use everything that you wrote down and find a way to implement those things into your business so that you never lose sight of what was motivating you along the way. Yes, you heard it here. Sherry J, thank you so very much. You're I welcome. thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this chat with you today. Good, but well, thank you guys for having me and I hope everyone enjoyed and be sure to stay connected. I'm Steve Nehart and you've been listening to the Trailblazers.fm podcast. If you're not yet doing so, consider following Trailblazers.fm on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and feel free to connect with me over on LinkedIn. Whenever you're posting stories or social media posts about Trailblazers.fm, be sure to use the hashtag TBPod and hashtag Mission Fuel. We'll be able to see you and I'll be able to show some love. And in case you're not aware, our show notes for all our episodes can be found on our website over at tbpod.com. Now, if today was your first time listening, I just want to say big ups, enough respect for checking us out. You've made this Jamaican guy really happy that you're here with us today. And I'd love your help with keeping this black excellence flowing each and every week. So if you haven't yet subscribed, hop on over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Search trailblazers.fm and subscribe, rate, and review us there. Be sure to browse through some of our past episodes. There are more than 150 published episodes now. And a little something is out there for everyone to help keep the knowledge flowing. We grow when you, as part of our Blazer Nation community, shares and invites your friends and family to listen to an episode you think might impact them most. 
we believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories are going to be moved to make significant changes that have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday morning at 5 a.m. Eastern. Blaze the Nation, go out today and find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Thank you.